I'll now introduce our moderator for today, Joshua Baca, Vice President of Plastics at the American Chemistry Council. Joshua. Thank you, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining. As Jennifer said, I'm Joshua Baca, and I am the Vice President of the Plastics Division at the American Chemistry Council. On behalf of our members and our partners, thank you so much for being here with us today. Our members are the leading producers of modern plastic material used to make countless consumer and durable goods and innovations that improve the quality of our lives, our environment, and the economy. And just like you, we care about the environment and have a forward-looking vision to protect it for generations to come. We're working with policymakers, brand owners, retailers, and a host of stakeholders to create a more circular and sustainable plastics industry. Our vision is guided by our circularity roadmap and outlines a bold plan uh, that we are executing through public policy, through partnerships and collaboration, through innovation, and through industry investments. We are implementing this roadmap with key partners across the value chain uh, to address both plastic waste in the environment and climate change. This includes several key components. First off, we are for a shared responsibility model that levies fees on packaging to ensure that those resources get redirected towards recycling infrastructure and consumer education. We are for the acceleration of advanced recycling technologies, which is the most effective tool at our disposal to capture more plastic waste and revolutionize how we use and reuse our plastic materials. We are for more recycled and circular content based on science and engineering to ensure that more used plastic is remade into new products. And we're for a national recycling standard that sets standardization across the US and improves access for consumers all across the country. This is a comprehensive bipartisan innovative strategy focused on sustainable change, fighting climate change and reducing plastic waste. Later this week, a misguided and harmful piece of legislation known as the Break Free from Plastics Pollution Act will be introduced. Supporters of this legislation will claim their intent is to end plastic waste. And as I just told you, we share that vision. Plastic in the environment is never acceptable, but after a careful analysis of the legislation, we have concluded it won't end plastic waste, but rather end the American plastics industry by restricting the production of modern and innovative plastic materials. Domestic supply chain would be disrupted and force businesses to search for alternatives, some they may not be available. Burdensome regulations would be imposed on already struggling industries and advanced recycling technologies will be prevented from coming to market and eliminate the best tool we have to recover more plastic waste. The legislation picks winners and losers, incentivizes materials that produce significantly more greenhouse gas emissions and it limits products essential to combating climate change. Let me give you a few examples, electric car vehicle batteries, solar panels and wind turbines. If passed into law, the legislation will also risk a shortage of critical items, ranging from masks to gowns, face shields and syringes, and specialized packaging for vaccines, undermining the global economic and health response to COVID-19. But today's panel of speakers are gonna tell you a very important story, a story about how plastics contribute so much to sustainable living. Let me be the first to acknowledge, we have more work to do to ensure plastic is kept out of the environment but we have a plan and we know it is a solvable problem and one that we are committed to. With that, I wanna introduce our first speaker, Jim Fitterling. Jim is the chairman and CEO of Dow and the chairman of the board of directors at the American Chemistry Council. Jim is a fantastic advocate for both sustainable and circular solutions, and his vision and his leadership has continued to guide us on this. I'd like to introduce Jim and turn it over to you. Thank you, Joshua, for that introduction, and thanks for inviting Dow to be part of this important discussion. And it is important as we talk about plastics, plastic waste, and the larger question of how moving the world forward towards a more circular economy is the right goal. I know we don't have a lot of time, so what I'd like to do is just share what I consider to be a few grounding principles when it comes to plastic waste and this legislation. First, one I believe that we all agree on, there's too much plastic waste ending up in the environment, and that is simply unacceptable. Second, we must do more to stop the waste while also closing the loop by creating a more circular economy. So at Dow, for instance, we have intended to stop the plastic waste by enabling 1 million metric tons of plastic to be collected, reused, or recycled through our direct actions and partnerships by 2030. And we aim to close the loop 
by enabling 100% of Dow products sold into packaging applications to be reusable or recyclable by 2035. And I know others here have also set aggressive targets to stop the waste and drive the plastics industry toward a more circular economy. Third, if our collective intent is to positively impact climate change and reduce carbon emissions, we need to acknowledge that plastics are critical to achieving both of those. It is clear that greenhouse gas emissions must be driven down through multiple sectors of the US economy, building and construction, vehicles, power generation, waste management, food production, consumer goods, and more. They can't do that without plastics. Plastics play an essential role in combating climate change because all economic sectors rely on the plastic supply chain to help them reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Plastics allow us to do more with less material, and that results in less greenhouse gas emissions than the alternative materials. If we want lower carbon electric cars, wind turbines, solar panels, and energy saving insulation, all things that reduce carbon emissions, we need plastics. The fourth item I want to stress is that while we agree we need a more circular economy that protects the climate, and there are provisions in the Break Free from Plastic Act that would do more harm to that than good. It would prevent advanced recycling technologies that can dramatically expand the types and amounts of plastics that can be recycled and reduce plastic waste. Under the act, these facilities are subject to a pause. We need to accelerate, not pause progress on these important recycling innovations. It would propose policies that restrict permits for plastic production for up to three years, stalling efforts to address plastic waste while simultaneously undermining the many positive benefits that plastics offer to society. And let's not forget that right now, our nation is administering millions of vaccines to our citizens, delivered in plastic syringes and packaged and protected in foam plastic packaging. The heroes injecting and the people receiving the vaccines are all wearing masks made with plastic fibers. And the pharmacists and clerks are all working behind plastic panels to help stop the spread. Last year, during the height of the pandemic, the people that make plastic production shifted production lines to make the materials we needed to fight the virus. Dow is one of the manufacturers of the raw materials behind personal protective equipment, hand sanitizers, disinfectants, IV bags, and food and medical supply packaging. We collaborated with partners to develop and donate medical gowns, face shields, and respirators. And like many US manufacturers, we saw it as our duty to help meet the overwhelming demand for these and many other supplies. In the midst of a climate crisis and a deadly pandemic, however, this legislation would put restrictions on the manufacture of the very materials that are driving real successes. A better approach for the environment and for consumers would be to focus on enabling a more circular economy, strengthening our nation's critical supply chains and reinforcing our critical manufacturing capacity. My fifth and final point is this. In his executive orders to strengthen US resilience, President Biden noted, the United States needs resilient, diverse, and secure supply chains to ensure our economic prosperity and national security. That's what the plastics industry is. That's who we are, and a key part of our nation's critical manufacturing capacity and workforce the third largest manufacturing workforce in the country and a critical part of the nation's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and positively affect climate change. Thank you so much for that, Jim. Great remarks. I want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ron Cotterman. Dr. Cotterman is the Vice President of Innovation and Sustainability at Sealed Air. Ron is going to, Dr. Cotterman is going to make some remarks and I'd like to turn it over to you now, sir. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I really i am pleased to be part of this panel. You mentioned my title of Innovation and Sustainability in Sealed Air. Well, I think I've got one of the best jobs to be able to use innovation to meet sustainability needs. But let me first introduce you to Sealed Air. Who are we? We're a leading global packaging solutions company. And where did we come from? It's in our name. We started with our iconic bubble wrap 60 years ago, where we were sealing air inside of bubbles. But today, 
we manufacture both paper and plastic packaging solutions. And while bubble wrap is still part of that packaging family, the majority of our business is focused on specialty packaging, plastic packaging that keeps foods fresher and safer for longer. So I was really pleased to be asked to be part of this panel today to share with you why we are committed to, to um, plastics and advanced recycling. At Sealed Air, we recently invested $8 million in a company that converts plastic waste into new plastic packaging, both because it's the right thing to do and it makes good business sense. Following that, we also announced how we could use that specialty packaging, in our case, the kind that wraps and extends the shelf life of cheese that can be collected and recycled back into new food grade packaging. This demonstration involved one of the UK's largest retailers, a major cheese manufacturer, an advanced recycling company, and a resin producer. So for us, plastic packaging is necessary, or I should even use the word essential, for getting those perishable food products from the point of where they're produced to the point where they're needed for consumption in groceries, restaurants, and even in your home. So for example, for fresh poultry, packaging that extends that shelf life can take a product that may only have a shelf life of two to three days to even two weeks or longer. This innovation through packaging has resulted in a reduction of food waste of over 65% in that case. And it further wise, the reduction in food waste means a huge reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, one of the key points that Jim had just made. So it's a critical strategy for any, any company or country focused on a, a zero carbon future. In addition, the life cycle studies show that the alternatives to plastic packaging generally increase the packaging weight, but also produce significantly more greenhouse gas emissions. And on average, twice the greenhouse gas emissions of, of plastics throughout their production and use. So at Sealed Air, we are leaning into innovation to develop that packaging that not only can reduce overall environmental impact, but it can protect those foods and other goods and is made from materials that can be recycled in a circular loop. Because at Sealed Air, we pledged by 2025, that 100% of our packaging will be recyclable and contain 50% recycled content. And we would not be able to attain this aggressive goal should, the, should this bill pass. For our food and medical packaging, we cannot make use of traditional mechanical recycled plastics to meet our pledge. We have concerns and there's issues around quality and safety. And so we rely on advanced recycling to meet those goals to ensure the protection of the essential products. Let me just conclude by saying that this bill, if passed, would halt the innovation that we see so critically needed for a circular economy for that plastic packaging and would limit free market investment. And that limitations on investment in advanced recycling in particular is bad for a private business like ours. As a leader in packaging, we are in the business to protect, to solve critical packaging challenges and to make the world better than we found it. And as Jim said, we need to accelerate. We need to accelerate the innovation needed to meet those sustainability needs. So thank you very much. Dr. Cotterman, thank you so, many, so much for those remarks. Uh, why don't we turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Bob Powell. Uh, Bob is the CEO of Brightmark and has a great story to tell us. So Rob, Bob, why don't I turn it over to you? Thanks, Joshua. And I wanna thank you very much for joining us today. Um, as Joshua said, I'm the CEO here at Brightmark, and I will tell you that our team is excited about the opportunity to actually deal with uh, an issue that we all know exists, which is we've got a plastic recycling shortfall, and there's a challenge associated with it. So our team, I believe, has the optimism and grit to tackle what it is we're facing. We don't think the best solution is to unfairly pick winners and losers in the marketplace by putting restrictions on production of highly efficient, durable, and versatile plastics. Plastics do amazing things for us. And as has already been mentioned, there are life-saving aspects of plastics, greenhouse gas reducing aspects of plastics as well. So um, what I would say would be, as a society, we've done this countless times where we've had a problem and we've leaned into and on technology and innovation with teams like 
the team we have here present to preserve the societal benefits of plastic while also protecting the planet. We simply don't, meet, uh, don't believe it is a mutually exclusive choice to think either plastics or the environment. We actually believe, and we're showing at Brightmark that we can solve the problem and preserve the great benefits of plastics. So we've got a brilliant team creating solutions uh, around this waste problem here at Brightmark. And we believe we can change the course and renew the world. So let me get specific with you. We've almost completed our $260 million advanced recycling facility in the town of Ashley, Indiana, Northeast Indiana. We've created many, many good paying manufacturing jobs. And as we uh, finish shortly, the project there now under construction for about two years, we'll employ 130 full-time people there, again, once we're fully operational. So when we're fully operational, that first phase in Ashley, Indiana, we're going to process at a scale unknown yet 100,000 tons of plastic waste per year and make valuable products, circular products, remaking plastics in addition to uh, other products like waxes and fuels. So we think that we've got a solution that meets our economies and societal needs. So this isn't just a pilot project for us that we're sort of trying out. The technology invented 15 years ago works, as you can see, at an operational scale and what we're doing is expanding our scale and scope. And we, uh, we intend to continue building facilities like the ones in Ashley, Indiana. A little bit over a year ago, we had a national RFP for communities who asked for us to build additional facilities like the one in Ashley throughout the United States. So we have three additional areas in addition to expanding in Indiana that we're focused in on. The Northeast, the Southeast, and then the Gulf Coast region, where we intend to build facilities that will process 400,000 tons of material a year, plastics, post use, into usable products. Each one of those projects in those three locations represent an investment of approximately 500 million and greater on a per site basis and employ many job, jobs. And in the process, what we believe we can do at scale is solve this issue globally by reusing, by creating a circular economy out of the post-use plastics. So um, we're extremely optimistic, but what we believe is if you limit our and others' ability to utilize advanced recycling uh, technologies with this legislation, you're going to hinder our progress, put a pause on solving what we believe to be one of the the Earth's most impactful issues. We can do it at Brightmark and we as a team here can absolutely do it. So I wanna thank you for uh, listening and uh, I'm very optimistic about the future here. Bob, thank you for those remarks. Thank you for being a leader and thank you for being an innovator. Um, why don't we turn it over next to uh, Bill Cooper. Uh, Bill is the Senior Vice President of Business Development at Agilex. Uh, Bill, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Great, thank you, Joshua. As Joshua mentioned, my name is Bill Cooper. I'm the Senior Vice President of Business Development at Agilex Corporation. I live in San Francisco and I grew up in Berkeley in off-grid cabins. I spent my life in the outdoors, hiking and fishing, and I love the environment. But I have a huge appreciation for the benefits that plastics bring to modern society and a great understanding of the need for solutions to deal with post-use plastic and plastic pollution. And this is where Agilex comes in. Agilex is 16 years old. We currently have over 70 employees, all with a focus on finding ways to recycle hard to recycle plastics. Not the water bottle or the milk jug, but the films, the single use plastics, the food service items, the packaging, keeping that material out of the landfill, keeping it away from incineration, and most importantly, keeping it out of the environment in the oceans. Agilex has a technology that utilizes pyrolysis. It's heating plastic in the absence of oxygen. And that's a critical point. There is no oxygen, there is no combustion, and there's no incineration. 
We utilize that heat to break down plastic to its core building blocks. And we can reuse those building blocks to create virgin equivalent plastics or intermediate products to create new plastics that all can go back to food contact or to pharma or whatever the original use of those products was. In doing this, we have a 40 to 70% lower carbon footprint than the original manufacturing of those materials. So this recycling helps with the greenhouse gas profile of plastics. In doing this, we enable our partners to take polystyrene back to polystyrene, acrylic back to acrylic, mixed waste plastics back to polyethylene and polypropylene. And we are doing this commercially now. In our history, we've recycled over 11 million pounds of plastic. Our current uh, facility in Tigard, Oregon, over 2.8 million pounds of polystyrene. To give you an idea how much that is, it's 30 miles of tractor trailers end to end filled with polystyrene foam. We have a number of facilities in development in the US, in Europe, and in Asia, and are driving growth and innovation related to recycling. As it relates to the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, the act suggests a temporary pause of up to three years in permitting advanced recycling facilities. These are the facilities that we're trying to build, Agilex, Brightmark. That will eliminate the US growth in this industry at a critical time. It will shift innovation to Europe and to Asia. It will shift jobs to Europe and to Asia. And it will cripple an industry that is focused on exactly what it should be focused on. Circular economies, circular pathways for plastics, green jobs, low carbon solutions, and reducing plastic pollution, keeping it out of the environment in the oceans. Advanced recycling is a great tool and this tool Working with mechanical recycling has the ability to increase recycling rates from the current 10% worldwide up to as high as 90%. So let's accelerate the growth of this new industry, not stop it. Thank you. Bill, excellent remarks. Also, thank you so much for your leadership and for all the work you're doing. Um, I want to change course a little bit here and uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marco Castaldi. Uh, Dr. Castaldi is a professor of chemical engineering at the City College of New York and is going to provide us a unique perspective on advanced recycling, sustainability, and circularity from his point of view. So, Dr. Castaldi, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you now. Thank you, Joshua, and uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to give my perspective on uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the years. Um, you've heard plastics are excellent material. that has improved the environment overall. They're used in cars uh, to improve gas mileage, packaging to protect and preserve uh, food, resulting basically in less waste. Uh, and they're also used in the medical field. I've done research in the area of sustainable waste management, <clears throat> primarily focusing on thermal conversion processes for nearly 20 years. Movements that ban technologies or materials never work because consumers worldwide rely on the materials and they're embedded into the economy. Instead of running away from plastics by trying to ban them, it's better to manage them properly using the best technologies that are available. There is not a single solution that will address the issue of plastic waste or any waste for that matter. All possible processes and techniques and technologies must be used to ensure that waste stays out of the environment. Banning production here will not stop products from being made. The US has some of the best waste management policies. They embrace the sustainable waste management hierarchy that encourages reduction, reuse, recycling, and energy recovery. But mechanical recycling of plastics has practical limits. Therefore, development of thermal or advanced recycling processes will complement those mechanical recycling efforts and it'll result in reduced energy usage, reduced virgin material extraction, and less waste going to landfills or persisting in the environment. 
As an engineer and researcher and educator, I've come to realize that we need solid science to guide policy decisions. The best way to improve our environment is with practical technologies and processes. Decisions that arbitrarily forbid the use of certain technologies force us into a situation where we don't have all the solutions available to us and prevents future engineers and scientists from improving systems that are designed to manage our waste. There's only so much one can learn from textbooks. <clears throat> we must work with the hardware to develop experiential learning that can only come with operations. I require that me and my team, students and young career engineers go on site physically to see, touch and experience the operation of all the technologies we work with when we conduct due diligences and other analyses. Policies that try to ban materials or forbid technologies have the opposite effect because it sends a message to the public that the material will no longer be produced or used and therefore they don't need to worry about it or what to do with it because it'll soon be gone. That won't happen. And it does nothing for the current situation where tons of plastic should be captured and recycled both mechanically and thermally recycled into new products. We need to find practical solutions to the problem today and future problems and tr instead of trying to make them disappear. I think this bill that is trying to be enacted will only hinder not only progress, but the education of the next generation of engineers and scientists. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Castaldi. I think you make a good point there. Bans never work, innovation does. So thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to our final speaker, Chris John. Uh, Chris is the president and CEO of the American Chemistry Council. Um, Chris, the floor is yours to close this out. Thank you, Joshua. Appreciate it. So we're at the uh, point of the agenda now where everything's been said, but not everybody said it. So I'm going to try to put a uh, fine point on a couple of key issues here. So look, people have legitimate questions about how plastics contribute to the problem of waste. But what gets our members out of bed in, in the morning is facing those types of challenges head on, confident in the knowledge that we're involved in manufacturing materials that can help us do more with less, that contribute to a more efficient use of resources, and that help address climate change and lead the way to a better planet and a safer world. And you've heard that here today from our previous speakers. Um, our efforts are focused on a few key areas, redesigning packaging, modernizing recycling, using advanced technologies to capture and reuse plastic, and closing the loop to keep plastics where they belong, out of the environment, and used as resources to make new materials. Now, America's plastics makers have set a goal for 100% of plastic packaging used in the United States to be recyclable or recoverable by 2030 and to be reused recycled or recovered by 2040. In just the past three years, over 60 projects worth over five and a half billion dollars in modern recycling technologies have been announced in the United States alone. These are game-changing technologies that have the potential to recover more than nine billion pounds of waste, mostly plastics, and keep them out of landfills. Many of these technologies will significantly expand the types and quantities of plastics that can be recovered and reused in new manufacturing. Let me give you a couple of examples. So Shell, for example, has committed to using 1 million metric tons of post-use plastics per year as feedstock at their chemical plants by 2025. CP Chem is running a commercial scale facility in Texas that makes circular polyethylene from mixed plastic waste. Lyondell Bissell has announced a goal to produce 2 million metric tons of recycled and renewable-based poly polymers by 2030. So as I conclude my remarks, let me be clear. America's plastics makers are already leading the way and acting as a catalyst, investing and innovating to create solutions. The congressional leadership should announce that the Break Free Bill as dead on arrival as introduced. During one of our gravest crises that our nation has ever faced, this bill would threaten lives by interrupting the manufacture of critical life-saving materials, suffocate economic growth, and threaten our environment and any hope of making significant progress in the fight against climate change. 
So we stand ready to work with Congress on bipartisan solutions to end waste, but they must be pragmatic. And we're ready to roll up our sleeves and get after it. So thank you for your time and attention today. And I'm going to turn it back to Joshua to facilitate the Q&A portion of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for the remarks. Thank you for everyone's remarks. Um, I think in my opening part, I said this is a solvable problem that can be done through collaboration, partnerships, and innovation. And I think the panel today gave a good demonstrative view of what that means.